All right, let's move on to the actual content for week one. I know that's much to the disappointment of poor old Kermit on our right, but let's look at what actually is an international business. What does that actually mean? On a very basic level, uh, an international business is any firm that engages in international trade or investment, which makes a fair bit of sense. It differs from domestic business or national business for a number of reasons. The first that we're going to look at in a few weeks time is national culture as you can see here. Certainly once you graduate from operating just within your home country to an international scale you will have to understand that different societies and different cultures and countries will have different expectations as to how you conduct yourself not only as a manager but also more broadly as a business. There are also considerable differences in terms of the political, economic and legal systems that we see on an international level. We're going to go through those in more detail next week in the videos. But certainly understanding that there are different political systems such as democratic societies versus totalitarian states and also different things like different legal systems whether there is a civil system uh, and legal system, whether there is a theocratic law system in place. You need to understand these differences as you expand your business horizons. There are clearly differences across labour and environmental standards. There have been a number of highly publicised cases of firms who have not adhered to the expected standards with regards to both labour and environmental standards. And certainly, as we'll talk about in, in weeks to come, this is quite disadvantageous to the firm if your, if your company does get embroiled in this sort of activity. So understanding and adhering to those standards is vitally important. There is also the issue of cash money. Understanding and, and being able to actually operate on a practical level uh, with the differences across foreign ex the foreign exchange markets is super important as well, of course. You need to be able to actually finance your operations on a global scale, which necessitates having an, a, at least a, a solid understanding of the differences that we see in terms of different currencies and across the foreign exchange markets of different countries. That seems like a fair bit to consider already as a firm uh, that is looking to internationalize beyond its home market and yet it doesn't even scratch the surface of what international business is all about. You also need to consider things like the study of trade theories and the environment that you as a firm will be facing as you look to internationalize it also looks at things like the strategies and the entry modes that are pursued by different firms and which of those might be most appropriate to your company as you look to internationalize. Just from a Monash perspective, just before we move on, it is important to note here that IB or international business is different to international management. Some of you may have already completed that unit already. Uh, some of you may be looking to complete it in your coming years here, but there is a difference and hopefully we'll establish that difference over the next few weeks. There is also the option of completing an IB major within your Bachelor of Business. So some of you may already be looking to complete that major. Some of you may not yet be considering international business as something you might like to focus on. Hopefully by the end of this semester, it might be something that you would like to look at. We can't really talk about international business without looking at the related and, and equally important notion of globalization. It's one of those things that you hear about all the time and yet you probably don't fully understand or certainly may struggle to properly define what we actually mean when we discuss globalization. It's certainly quite a fashionable term which has emerged in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, largely in response to rapid changes in structures of around the world and in particular things and major events like the fall of the Berlin Wall. There certainly isn't a cogent theory of globalization. We can't really have a one-size-fits-all approach when we try to understand it. And it's used, the sort of thing that's used to refer from anything from the internet to a hamburger, as we'll highlight in your workshops. It's certainly not a new phenomenon. It's the sort of thing that's been happening implicitly for actually for centuries and extended periods of time. If we go way back to the Roman and Mongolian empires, as they sought to expand their empires, they effectively brought the world closer together by sort of uh, standardizing different uh, 
operating procedures and expectations and cultural aspects uh, as they expanded their empires. More recently, as we've looked at things like European colonization, we see the same thing occurring. So perhaps not quite as we understand globalization today, but the same thing was largely happening, bringing the world closer together. Bill Clinton, he, he described and noted that globalization certainly isn't something that we can sort of stop or avoid. It's this economic equivalent of a force of nature like wind or water. It is omnipresent and something that is part of our daily lives, whether we realize it actually or not. Interestingly, though, we've actually seen over the last couple of years, probably more than that, the last half a decade or so, there's been a bit of a pushback and perhaps a bit of a shift from globalization to what we could describe as localization as more and more cultures and indeed countries have said we actually don't want to be just part of this global whole we want to be recognized as being different and unique and separate from the other parts of the world around us this is very much typified by people like donald trump his his slogan of making america great again and sort of separating themselves and focusing on what is best for america uh, rather than necessarily what is best from a global perspective is absolutely uh, representative of this shift towards perhaps global localization rather having said that the the power and, and the fact, the way in which globalization is all around us is typified by one of my favorite examples here. That is the exact pin that Donald Trump wore as part of his uh, presidency campaign. And if you can see down in that little picture, yes, the American flag is made in China. So even when you are trying to promote localization as Donald Trump has largely been doing, globalization does seem somewhat unstoppable. In terms of a proper definition, certainly we, there have been a few attempts. So one that we've listed here is that it can be seen as the widening, deepening and speeding up of worldwide interconnectedness in all aspects of contemporary social life. So we're talking about everything from global markets to the internet. And the internet, as we'll talk about over the next few slides, has certainly been a major driver of uh, globalization. And we can see that in examples from our everyday lives. Here in Australia, we can jump online and if we really feel like it, go to an American website and buy some, or at least bid for, some historic collectibles and firearms. Don't ask me why, but we can. This is part of globalization that from the comfort of our living rooms, we can do this now. You can jump online again and legally, of course, stream your episodes of Game of Thrones when you just can't wait to see what happened to Daenerys. And even when we feel like doing that little bit of online shopping, which looks great on the site and inevitably ends up looking not quite the same when it arrives to our household. All of these things that we do every single day in our lives so, are, are great examples of how the internet and how that has sped up and driven this process of globalization. When we look at it from an economic perspective, there are two main components that we need to consider. First is the globalization of markets and the subsequent consumption. And secondly is the globalization of production. We're going to look at both of these and a couple of other additional factors in the next video in this week's series.